So and, um, a colleague of mine, David Rankin, he talks about this idea that the best metaphor for teacher education is really engineering. And all too often, we borrow our metaphor for teacher preparation from like medical schools or science. But in science, there is, and in medicine especially, there is best practice and bad practice. Best practice, you live. You don't die. Bad practice, your patient dies. Education's really not like that. It's more like engineering. It's about better practice. And the idea that what we need to do is try new things for new situations and adapt. So you, you might have an initial blueprint, but depending on the materials available, you might modify your plan. But today is about the foundation. What is it that effective literacy teachers do to incorporate literature well into their classroom? And this is all based on from your reading, so you should be able to follow along. But the most important thing is that literature-rich classroom. So let's look quickly at this image. What do you guys see? What do we see in this image? What do folks see? Books. Books! Yeah, there's books. But look how they're arranged. So it's kind of set up, you know, you have different categories here. You have by genres down there. Some that are open. So this is a very developed classroom library. And I already told you, your best friend as new teachers is the garage sales. I mean, garage sale season is winding down, but when you get close to graduating, start hitting them up, find those quarter bins of books, you know, and you just need to start building them up. Um, another idea for building up your classroom library, I call it the No More Mug Club. If you're an elementary teacher, holiday time, you inundated with coffee mugs. And there's only so many you need. So you send a little letter home to parents, say, hey, look, give me holiday gifts this year. We're going to do a book drive for the classroom. Please, you know, pick five, pick some titles and, and you know, put them in, and I'll write your name donated by your student. It's the, you know, but, so that's a different way to build up your classroom library over time. And you notice there's different posters in the room signifying um, ideas. So you have to create a literature-rich environment. Somebody did the um, blog post about the teacher who had the old to uh, uh, tow, tub, tow footed tub in their classroom. And they're in free writing, free reading. You're allowed to go crawl in the tub, and you can read in that. They're basically celebrating literature. And in this picture, you can see that what the teacher is doing is basically enveloping they're students in literature. They're surrounded by it. And this is literature rich classrooms also make it comfortable to read. All right. How many people are reading a novel right now? It's okay if you're not. Yeah. You sit at a desk like this when you read a novel. No, but we expect kids to do that in the classroom. It is the most unnatural way to read. So if you have the space, create small little nooks in the room when it is time for choice reading or novel reading, or you know. So the, what you see here in this picture is there's a little couch for them to read at. Let them sit on the ground. Let them sit on their desks. Let them sit under their desks. You want to make them enjoy reading. And to do that, you have to create a literature-rich environment that celebrates the word. You have to create a literature-rich classroom that makes it comfortable to read. No one reads novels sitting at desks. Literature-rich classrooms celebrate student work and student writing. So you can see here that you have examples of, of their drawings, of their writing. And what the teacher did is took string across the classroom. You know, 
and wires and just uses clips, close pins, to just get more wall space. Your wall space should be a land that celebrates not only literature, but celebrates your students as readers and writers. But that is something that we've talked about often, that we want to create a community. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to have a community of readers and writers. You can't just dictate communities. You have to build them. And to build that, you create the culture of celebrating what good readers and writers do. You enculturate your students into that community that they are successful readers and writers. And sure, you build in, there's opportunities for a ton of explicit instruction in areas such as phonics, fluency, word recognition, comprehension. But we're talking about ways that you celebrate the student as a member of a reading and writing community. And by showing off their work, you do that. Literature-rich classrooms take advantage of things like word walls. Here's an example from probably a younger grade, so for your 308 students. And here we have kind of sight words organized by letter. So you can think of new ways to create a literature-rich classroom. In older grades, these kind of word walls, they might be more concepts, say in social studies, thematic units in literature. I love doing my bulletin boards, and when I taught um, language arts, I tried to organize my units into themes, so we might be covering like plot. Um, so I'd look at plot from four different elements, and my room would be like covered in just different ways to support the learners. I was also a math teacher, so my math word wall also had to help support learning. Literature-rich classrooms <coughs> take advantage of environmental print. You know what's environmental print? <coughs> yeah, so street signs packed too. So what, what do you think what's what do you think that means, environmental print then? Yeah, applicable text every day. Stuff. So where do you see this picture? Cereal boxes. Cereal boxes. And what do the students do? Yeah, look at the C, R, and then, you know, his, his I that he's working on. They're copying the cereal boxes. And notice what do you see back here on the bins? Yes, everything is labeled, especially for your 308 students in a preschool classroom. You need labels everywhere, um, often in multiple languages. But you know you should have where things go because not only that, you're, you're helping teach categorization, which is just a great thinking skill. But really, you're surrounding your students in environmental print. What we're seeing here is that the teacher is using cereal boxes as a form of environmental print. One of the most amazing things I've ever seen, and it was a first grade teacher that we had to come present here at a conference a few years back. He had his parents collect um, cereal boxes, and then he bought a ton of shipping tape, and he literally built a castle in his classroom where kids could go in and read during um, reading time, or go in and just go on uh, environmental print scavengers hunts. It was the coolest thing I've ever seen. I, I, I couldn't do it. Um, but what you're seeing here is the work with environmental print. So literature-rich classrooms take advantage of environmental print. And finally, and this wasn't in the reading, I added this, literature-rich classrooms Support interactive reading and writing by having an online space. You need to have what we're starting, I used to call this just, you know, your online space. 
uh, my colleague Ian O'Byrne, who's right next door at UNH, has started to call it your digital hub. And you need to have your digital hub built. <coughs> That's why I'm having you build to take the baby steps by trying out Blogger. Because you need to create, if you want to have a literature rich classroom, a space where you can do this all online. All the slides that we just showed, you can do and extend your learning in online spaces. Environmental print, you can build in different elements. You can have kids build collages of things that they found. So for example, if you're celebrating the word tea, you could have kids use, um, you could go through Google Images and just find tea words and maybe make three kinds of teas. Think about what are the sounds of teas made. You could just have the tuh, like, or the, or the tr, like the tr, th, or just a plain t vowel. Mix them up and let kids sort them out online or give, give those resources to parents. A word wall. You can have a vocabulary section to your classroom website. Celebrate, I mean, celebrating student work in your digital hub is very simple. You just basically create a space online for kids to share their work. And man, do grandma and grandpa love it when they can go and, and look at little Johnny's or big report on the website with his pictures and some sounds. So you could do that online too. You can create spaces for reading online also by using things like discussions or Edmodo or giving your kids a place to discuss the literature that they're reading in an online space. And you can create a library of online resources. Every single topic known to humankind is available online. So if you have students that have very niche um, interests, you can find a text for them to read. And as a teacher, you can curate those texts and kind of build your own online repository of texts you want your kids to read. So to me, you can't have a literature-rich classroom anymore without starting to build your digital hub. So what are, what are some of the other effective literacy practices that teachers do? You're going to get sick of hearing them say it, but they model, model, model. Sure, right now I'm using a lot of direct instruction. And after this, we'll work on an activity where you have to model through texts. But the idea is you have to make what good readers do inside their head explicit to students. You have to model decoding skills for younger students. You have to model the uh, concepts about print, how you hold a book, open a book, with your very youngest students. Right? Effective literacy and literature teachers do a lot of modeling. More so today, you can actually have your kids learn to be the models and model for their peers. So let's look at a quick example. Good readers, so that constant reminder, what do good readers do? You need to think about what the author is trying to say. There are lots of things good readers think about while they read. Like love, and then they use that when they learn something new. Or ooh, this reminds me of when we make a connection. Or I can picture what that must be like when writing has feelings. In this podcast, we are going to focus on a very important kind of thinking while reading. I hear some kids say, huh? What does that mean? Or, um, what exactly is going on here? We have been learning how to watch 
for these times when we get confused. Good readers stop and pay attention to that kind of thing. This is called monitoring your reading. Monitoring means to watch to make sure something is right. Okay, so the first step of modeling is an explicit definition. We're providing an explicit definition to the skill that they want to model. Monitoring for understanding. on election day, we had election monitors to make sure people only voted once. So, to monitor your reading means to check and make sure you understand what you are reading. There are plenty of reasons why readers get confused. It happens to everyone, even our brilliant teacher. He told us to put the brilliant part in. The important thing is what you do when you realize that you may be a little confused. Good readers stop and try to figure it out. If you ignore it, you'll only get more confused and the book won't be enjoyable. There are different things you can do to figure out the confusing parts. We call them fix-it strategies. One fix-it is to reread re the part that you are confused about. When you reread what you already read, it might make more sense to you the second time. It also makes sure you didn't miss anything by accident. When I was reading about deep sea now here's a mod. At first I got confused. When the text said gopher eels unhinge their jaws, I reread the paragraph. I figured out that it meant they make their mouths open really wide. When I was reading the gold thread dress, I didn't understand the word provoke. So I reread and understood that it must mean to tease or stir up trouble. Another fix-it strategy is to continue reading and look for more information. Sometimes things only make sense when you finish a paragraph or a section. When I was reading, plants we didn't feed themselves. I didn't understand the word, so that plants so they kind of email. So I kept on reading and found out it meant that the they audio is a little off sync, which is, I've used this all the time. The message change, Never is Another good fix it strategy is to stop and think about what you already know. Sometimes you can understand tricky parts just by thinking about them. In the book Brindle, I didn't know the word Carrington. I thought about it and I realized it must be the name of a town. Thinking about what you already know can also help you visualize and make connections. Stopping and asking yourself questions is a fix-it strategy that can help you refocus. This is a lot of strategies, fix it's strategies for one, like, I would probably just do one of them, two of them, but it's cute to see the kids do it. And this idea that you can use your kids to create these lessons for their peers. And their bodies. So I looked at the pictures and saw the sharp edges of the leaves and the tiny hairs that looked like needles. So when you are reading and the voice in your head says, huh? you need to stop and try and figure out what the book is saying. That's what good readers do. Try the fix-it strategies and see which one works the best. It is still confusing. There are other strategies you can use, like making a connection, or visualizing, or asking yourself questions. We will talk more about these in other podcasts. Now, so we saw them where they explicitly define, they model the skill. The next thing you would do when you're modeling is you then provide opportunities of guided practice. So you'd have a text ready if you're working on fix-it strategies. And you'd want to, you know, have kids try them out with you and with one another. And then you give them their text, whatever literature they're reading, whether it be, you know, an assigned novel from class or a personal choice, and then have them return to their comfy spots to read and to basically reflect, read and reflect on the fixed strategies that they use. So that's independent practice. So in summary, we know that effective literature teachers model. And modeling involves a process of 
explicit definition, modeling, guided practice, and independent practice. We know that effective literature and literacy teachers provide a lot of opportunity for explicit decoding practice. And we'll talk a lot more about this in 301 and 318, or for you folks, 305 and 306. Um, but the idea that you have to put in, there has to be a lot of opportunity, especially the younger grades, to focus in on phonological links um, and building those skills in. If I remember, this video is slightly cheesy. Sounds. That's Learn for 308. That's where you start. Word. It's as easy as doing your name game. Let's try Sophie. Sophie, Sophie, Bogopi, Banana, Pana, Pogopi, Me, My, Mogopi. Sophie, you'll probably have as much fun with it as they do. I mean, and we'll spend weeks in 305 really talking about phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, and phonics. Um, but just, you know, talking about levels of uh, phonemic awareness, you know, there, it breaks out into just different ideas. So, like, just recognizing when words rhyme for preschool. That's where you're doing a lot of it, you know, ages three and four. Playing with rhyme words and doing rhyme matching games. And play games where, like, if the word rhymes, touch your head. And things like that. Um, and then, you know, after that, students start to get an awareness of syllables and can kind of clap out and know that words are made up of multiple syllables. So if you give them a two-syllable word, they might be able to clap it out. Then, you know, we move into this idea that, like, onsets and rhymes, that you could have cat, but what's a word that ends in A-T but starts with a sound? You know, and they might be able to come up with that. Um, then you start to, now you're basically, you can substitute. So you can give them a picture of a cat and a hat and tell them, give them a letter and have them draw eye to the pictures. It's basically, they're substituting the onset, the start of the word, with the rhyme, the end of the word. And again, we're going to cover this in way more detail in our, in our, our other reading classes. 
Then they can, then after, like, you'll start to some preschool, maybe in, in kindergarten, you start to isolate phonemes, isolate sounds. So you'll have kids stretch out and smush words together. You know, so cat, cut, at, cat. You can maybe take a slinky and pull it out while you're stretching a word and then smash the slinky together when you're putting the, the, all of the, the phonemes together. And this is something that we know that effective literacy teachers do. Now, starting in like kindergarten, first, second grade, your students can actually count phonemes. So you might give them an activity that's called something like say, move it, where you can give them tokens, and they put a series of tokens in front of them, and every time they hear a sound in a word, they have to be able to move up a token. So you see if they have the same number of tokens. This is all explicit instructions in decoding. We know, which is an effective practice. And you'll spend a lot of time developing these, these units. So the furthest step in basic phonemic awareness is then being able to substitute phonemes. So if I gave you the word mommy and I said, you know, what happens if I change some of the ends to a T? Then you get Tommy, you know, so you're starting to really manipulate and play with words. So we know that effective literature teachers do a lot of decoding practice in their classrooms. Effective language arts teachers teach writing too often. I mean, that, that sounds like dumb, Dr. McVary. Of course they teach writing. But you would be surprised at how often we just assume our students have writing skills. And so, 308, we are doing letter formation, but you're also doing things such as um, inventive spelling, or you're letting kids draw out their stories, where you give them a piece of pa uh, paper and you tell them to write you a story, but it's all in drawing, and, it might, and then you just ask them to narrate the story back to you. In the upper grade levels, you have to provide them opportunities to write the genres that you're reading. So if you're doing, if you're reading about mystery, if you're reading about fables, if you're reading about myths, or you're doing memoirs, connect the literature that you're reading in class to the writing instruction that you're doing. And just like reading, model, model, model. You do think alouds and read alouds, do write alouds. Make it self-evident what good writers do in their heads Make that transparent for your students. Effective teachers scaffold their curriculum. And it's spiraled in the sense of they're building on top. Each element builds on top of the other. You want to spiral your instruction and provide different scaffolds. And this allows for greater differentiation. And we basically talk about three kinds of differentiation. Differentiating the text. Differentiating the process. Or differentiating the product. And, or, and there any combination of those three. More so now, there's more emphasis on differentiating the process and the product and trying to keep a common text in the classroom. Um, but you can think about, and that's something, that's a skill of effective teachers. And it's a skill that is very hard to master. Being able to provide a level of differentiation without staying up till 3 in the morning, creating 22 different lessons. It is a skill we'll work on and one you'll master by the time you graduate. Well, one you'll, you'll be on your road towards mastery of that skill. I still haven't gotten it down yet. Effective literacy teachers connect the text to talk. Reading comprehension is improved through two things. Two. Really. Text-based analysis 
and text-based talk. Well, that you have control over. Background knowledge is probably the, the third element, and you can do build that by, you know, giving a lot of in-depth content for instruction. But as a reading teacher, text-based talk and text-based analysis. And especially in early childhood education, oral language development is the most key ingredient to reading comprehension instruction. Kids need to hear you talk about text. They need to hear you use words in context about text. They need to just be engaged in conversation to develop their oral vocabulary. If you want to improve the reading comprehension skills of third graders, focus on oral language development in preschool. That is your major job as an early childhood education instructor, is developing those oral language skills. According to the articles we read, effective language writers and literacy teachers also engage in text structure analysis. Text-based analysis. We just talked about text-based talk, but text-based analysis. You have to teach your kids to identify specific types of text structures. And later on in the semester, when we talk about reading informational texts in the classrooms, we'll focus in on text structure. But there's certain elements, like there's only there's that authors use some conventions, some grammars. Like there's a chronological text, the cause and effect, um, descriptive text, problem solution, and they each have their own unique way of being organized. They use different kinds of transition words. They use different kinds of organization. And if you can teach your students to recognize those text elements, you will be a more effective language arts teacher. <coughs> effective language arts teachers also engage in author or genre studies. You do have a scaffold curriculum that is focusing on improving their word recognition, their fluency, their decoding skills, their comprehension skills. But you can also couch that within a much larger kind of author study or genre study. And we're going to be spending, especially in the second half of this semester, we'll be spending a lot of time talking about author study and more specifically genre studies. Effective language arts learners and teachers, well, one, they just read a lot. And they read to their students a lot. They celebrate a culture read. And one way to do that is to make home connections to support literacy at home. Parental reach out is critical. You want your parents to be able to communicate and know what you're doing at home so they can do it at school. 